Hello, all you big, beautiful brains out there. Ever work super hard on something really stressful, and the second it was over and you think, maybe I can relax for a minute, boom, you get sick? Today, we're talking about the letdown effect. Before we get started, take a minute to subscribe to Psy vs. Psy. Help out your friendly neighborhood psychologist while I tell you all about the letdown effect. This one turned into a wild ride, so strap yourselves in. What I found out turned out to be surprising. We should start with a quick intro of what I mean by the term letdown. Medically, you'll hear the term letdown used for the release of a certain chemical in the body after the birth of a baby that starts milk production. In aeronautics, you'll hear letdown as the term used for when a plane begins to descend. In my house growing up, the term letdown was used a lot, but it usually had something to do with me. When we talk about the letdown effect in psychology, we're talking about that really common experience of ending a period of prolonged psychological stress with a physical illness. This topic was first brought up to me by someone mentioning how they always get sick once their school semester is over. It's kind of like you prevent yourself from getting sick during finals week through sheer willpower. And then when you don't need to be that vigilant anymore, you will get sick. Of course, I thought, what a great idea for a video, as it seemed to match my own experience, and plus it's just a really catchy name. But as I began researching the scientific literature, things started to get weird. No, not the good kind of weird. I could barely find any research papers on this topic under the term letdown effect or really any of the other terms I could think of. In popular magazines, I found one person who appeared to be the biggest advocate out there on the letdown effect and labeled it as such in all the articles I could find, from the Huffington Post to Psychology Today. However, that person hasn't actually conducted any empirical research on the topic as far as I can tell, nor do they cite any sources. Most of the articles I could find that cover the letdown effect were interviews with that person who was promoting their self-help book, but who had never actually conducted scientific research in that area. With some digging, I found out they actually worked teaching medical students, not doing research. Both really important jobs, just not the same thing. So I started to wonder, is the letdown effect even a real thing? Before we look for the letdown effect, let's acknowledge what we do know about stress and the immune system. There's a whole huge field of science devoted to understanding the links between short and long-term stress on immune function. You've got three important systems that all work together to maintain balance in your body, the nervous system, the endocrine system, and the immune system. They communicate back and forth with each other using chemicals like neurotransmitters, hormones, and for the immune system, molecules called cytokines. When you get stressed, your brain triggers the release of stress hormones through the circuitry between your hypothalamus, pituitary gland, and adrenal glands, called the HPA axis. Stress can also activate your fight or flight response through the autonomic nervous system. Your immune system's response to stress will depend on how much each of these pathways is activated, the type and duration of the stress, and your current body conditions. Generally speaking, most scientists recognize that stress suppresses the immune system. This makes sense if you think about where to spend your body's energy. For example, you could reduce your activity levels and burn energy to increase body temperature and kill off an invading virus. That's what a fever's for, after all. However, if you get attacked by a bear, you may need to temporarily suspend Operation Antivirus and transfer that energy to escaping danger. Accordingly, your autonomic nervous system can reduce your immune response to deal with the more immediate threat, temporarily making you more vulnerable to illness. Tons of studies have shown that people who undergo stress are more susceptible to illness, such as increased likelihood of respiratory infection and common colds during times of mental stress, or increased bacterial infections during daily chronic stress. Other studies have shown reduced activity of immune cells during depression, after the death of a loved one, or after a natural disaster like a hurricane. 
There are many researchers studying how illness can affect your behavior as well, and hundreds of studies around all types of molecules and signals and brain areas involved. Recent research has even indicated that gut microbiota, the friendly bacteria that live in your stomach, play an important role in stress-related illnesses. There's good news here, since a growing number of studies have shown that stress-reducing interventions can help reduce the risk of getting sick during stressful times. A whole host of techniques, from relaxation training and meditation to hypnosis, have all been shown to lower immune challenges under stress. But here's the problem. None of those studies suggest that the illness should happen after the stressor is over. Instead, they suggest that the most vulnerable times are during the stress. This would make the letdown effect all the more surprising. Why would you become more susceptible after the stress is gone? That leads us to the evidence for the letdown effect. I could only find one paper that looked at the letdown effect scientifically. They had people who were chronic migraine sufferers keep logs of mental health and the onset of their migraines. They found that migraines were actually more likely to happen just after a major stressor was relieved, such as on the weekends when people finally had a break from going to their job. That's it. That's the only study I could find. I mean, that's great since being able to predict migraines makes it easier to prevent them, but hardly convinces me that the overall letdown effect I've seen on countless magazine articles is real. These claims just don't seem to match the science. But maybe the research just isn't there yet. For starters, the population you need to study the letdown effect has to, by nature of the effect, be dealing with prolonged periods of stress. That brings out ethical concerns and gets even more complicated when you start considering rating the stress to see how impactful it is. Everything gets super complicated super fast. You'd be limited to participants who are undergoing natural stressors, so that makes it harder to do this research. We'd be remiss then if we didn't at least consider that the limited experimental data could just be because there isn't really a lot of support. It is entirely possible to know about something anecdotally that has limited scientific support. In fact, it's kind of become something psychology is known for. Is this just an area that needs more study, or should psychologists begin looking for alternative explanations? It might be the case that we just haven't done the right studies to see the letdown effect. However, I'm going to make an alternative suggestion. Maybe it's more of an illusion. Maybe it turns out that the times after the supposed stress are actually themselves really stressful. They mark transitions into new schedules, new environments, different people all around you, and so on. And change itself can be really stressful. Maybe the absence of your favorite professor is harder on you at the end of the semester than you think. Or maybe people are more likely to come to big events like final exams when they're sick because those events are so important. And therefore, people are more likely to pass on illnesses. What do you think? Leave a comment with your alternative explanation for why it might look like there's a letdown effect when really, it might not be there. If you want to see more videos from us, about stress, the weird things our brains do to our bodies, or why I'm such a disappointment to my parents, <laughs> make sure you subscribe to Psy vs. Psy so you can get all of our other videos and you can learn all about the science of psychology. Until next time, keep thinking, and I'll see y'all later. Bye! When you think you're about to watch a video about a really cool psychological effect, Sorry to be a letdown. <laughs>